So my name is Clive Pursehouse. I'm one of the assistant directors uh, for actually residential life. So that involves uh, folks living in the residence halls uh, for housing and food services. And I also have a uh, sustainability responsibility that's part of my role as well. And I am uh, also sustainability focused in my position. I'm the project and purchasing specialist for UW Dining. So Clive and I are both on the HFS sustainability committee as well as actively participating in this local food system. Uh, Casey and I are representing four people today. Two of them couldn't be here. So unfortunately for you all, uh, Tracy McRae, who's our executive chef, is quite the dynamo, and she wasn't able to make it today. She's not feeling well. And then Claudia, who uh, works with UW Sustainability, has asked me to share a little bit at the end of our presentation in terms of going from, I guess it's sort of peppered throughout, in terms of going from uh, HFS to the UW when it comes to sustainability. Uh, and, and this is sort of a, a timeline of the broader university's uh, commitment to sustainability. You can see starting in, in 1973, which as old as I am was actually before I was born, uh, but not by much. Um, with uh, with campus-wide recycling, um, we started composting in, in 04. From there, uh, same year, we uh, penned a environmental stewardship policy um, UW Farm came about two years later in 2006. 2008, Claudia's office, the UW Environmental Stewardship and Sustainability Office, was created. And then in 2009, the UW College of the Environment has, was founded. And there are other things that are not listed there, including things like the Campus Sustainability Fund, student organizations, and, and other initiatives. Um, but I'm mostly here to talk to you about HFS and the role that HFS has played in the UW's broader sustainability mission. If you went back to sort of those early 2000s, mid 2000s, uh, HFS was probably the primary driver uh, around sustainability on our campus. And if you look at uh, some of the ACE models around, and that's the uh, American Association for Sustainability in Higher Education, a lot of those models, uh, they grade and they rate schools, and you'll see in a moment sort of how the UW ranks. But most of those models really, uh, are the integral, an integral element of those models is dining and food, and especially dining and, and facilities. So um, we've, we've naturally played a role uh, in the university's broader sustainability mission. On this screen, uh, I have uh, two, three logos. Uh, one of them is from our restaurant Cultivate, which emphasizes a local uh, food bent. Uh, the, the student group Seed, which is actually, they've updated their logo, so this is an outdated version of that. And then uh, you see a USGBC, which is the US Green Building Council, uh, lead gold sort of uh, logo, or, or it's, it's on many of the plaques in all, all of our new buildings uh, have been built to these lead standards. So um, we, we, we do take it seriously. However, we do have some limitations too, given the size of our organization. Uh, we do over 40,000 transactions a day from a dining and food perspective. And so uh, our ability is sometimes limited by what the, the volume of things that we might need, for example where a really small uh, farm or a farm stand or something may not be able to assist us. So a little bit about um, SEED, the stu Students Expressing Environmental Dedication, founded in 2002. Uh, it's a student organization that's under our sort of overall hall government um, that really works with us sort of hand in hand and actually I would say pushes HFS uh, on any given year to really think differently or challenges us to take on an initiative or a project. Um, this, this goes way back, and, and I'm actually in this photo in my, in my 20s, uh, which seems like forever ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can zoom in later if you're so inclined. But um, we, they used to, the group used to do sort of campus cleanups on a regular basis, not something that they necessarily do uh, so much anymore. But it is an organization that's been at the center of our initiatives, and as a student, focused and student serving department, uh, all of our funding, we are a self-sustaining auxiliary. So what that means is we don't receive any funding from the University of Washington or from the state. So every dime that we spend or that we invest to, to build or to pay staff uh, comes from students who sleep and eat on campus. That's, that's where all of our funding comes from. So uh, sort of looked at a timeline of the University of Washington. Uh, HFS, you could argue, maybe started a little earlier. In 1970, uh, in Old Lander Hall, 
Uh, we sort of had the original living learning community. It was a student-based um, environmental community, uh, and, and those folks, uh, from, they came back actually when we tore down Old Lander Hall. Uh, they were among the groups that, of, of sort of alumni that came back to see us. Um, 2002, 2003, SEED is formed, um, and then in autumn of 2003, and this is sort of illustrates the role that SEED has played, uh, they launched a paper recycling pilot uh, in partnership with us, because at the time, we actually did not recycle paper on the residential floors. Um, uh, in, two in the mid-2000s, we really initiated um, in Seattle, but, but nationally as a, as a university, uh, compostable wear. And um, I was here back then, and I, I recall the spoons melting in the food. And it was bad. Uh, students would get their soup, they'd throw the spoon there, they'd put it down, they'd go do whatever and they come back and literally the spoon would flop. Um, it was like a wet noodle, uh, and it was, it was wet corn. Um, and, and so we, we went through a number of iterations and partnered with these, these vendors very aggressively and, and really drove a lot of innovation um, nationally. You can see the next bullet is in 2009, we actually partnered with Cedar Grove. Cedar Grove manages all of the compost for the King County municipality. Um, and we partnered with them to, and, and Coca-Cola, which in sustainability language, Coca-Cola is not seen as a great champion of sustainability. But we sort of, with Seed's involvement, uh, really more or less forced them to come up with a model for a compostable uh, cold cup. And cold cups are special because they have wax and things that, are, that need to be a part of them so the cups don't come apart. Um, but, but I think because of our size and our buying power, and really having a student voice behind us, we felt like we could go to Coke and, and make some demands, and, and they came through with us. Uh, in 2010, we've hosted uh, institutes and conferences on sustainability, and as Casey and I sort of uh, alluded to, um, our positions uh, include sustainability in the, in the descriptions as well. So HFS was one of the first departments on this campus to actually have a department-wide sustainability committee. Uh, that was created by our executive director and assistant vice president in 1314. Um, it's a departmental standing committee. It's made up of the chair. I happen to be that person right now. Uh, a student seed director, uh, an advisor for that group, and then five or six different uh, staff members from across our department. We are a large department, and including our students, uh, student staff, student workers, RAs, uh, folks who work in the dining facilities, we are approaching 1,000 employees. Uh, at any one time, is that, is that accurate? I knew it used to be 800, I've been here so long, but it's, it's actually much more than that. Um, and the committee is, is charged with identifying and, and completing or figuring out projects each year related to sustain, sustainability throughout the department. We oftentimes also do things like this. We partner with a lot of campus sustainability fund student-driven projects um, as well. So. So as a part of that, and sort of to demonstrate the seriousness of our commitment, and I'm not going to read these slides to you. They're very dense from a text point of view. I'll just sort of summarize, summarize them. Summarize? I don't, I don't know. Um, I'll summarize them for you uh, as we go through. But we were also the first department to create a sustainability mission and vision statement. Um, and sort of we wanted to do, we were working with different student groups who were asking things of us. We couldn't always deliver on those things. And so the... The sort of, and I'll just uh, maybe share some of my own bias, some of the, the laziness in response was, well, then you're not really committed to sustainability if you won't do this one niche project that I want you to focus on. And, 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 and you know, openly I disagree with that and, uh, because we do a lot. Um, and so we decided it was important for us to be able to articulate our values and what we will do uh, when it comes to sustainability sort of year in and year out. So we really focused um, on, on three, four main components of our mission. Um, and those were building and maintaining high-performance uh, residential communities that are, are sustainably built and, and managed. Um, and, and we talked about like how we would do that, and that's what these bullets are. And again, um, I won't bore you with all of the details. I know that you're uh, quite capable of reading. Um, and do they get a copy of this? And so you can read it on your own. Um, but we talk about things like our green cleaning policies and the chemicals that we use and don't use uh, to, to maintain those. We talk about our waste diversion rates. Um, in addition to composting, we also have a thing called summer scram, which uh, is basically you have a bunch of students moving out. 
Uh, a lot of students coming from afar, they may be coming from other parts of the US or from another country. They have all this stuff they acquired. It's perfectly good. They don't want to take it with them. Maybe they can't take it with them. It's not, it's not logistically possible. We don't want them throwing that stuff away. So we actually uh, partner with uh, other regional organizations uh, for you know, adults with developmental disabilities, the food bank, to sort of collect those things and keep them from going into the waste stream. Um, we also talk about valuing and facilitating a residential learning environment that has uh, opportunities for students to learn about sustainability. And again, we, we really lean into SEED uh, as an organization that's been around 18 years um, and uh, has really outlasted a lot of student organizations around sustainability that have come and go, come and gone uh, over that time. We talk about sort of uh, sustainability being part of our uh, offerings for students in terms of programming and, and educational conversations that we have uh, through a, a team of students that are responsible for that uh, in our residence halls. We also talk about um, exercising responsible financial stewardship. And, and if you think back to uh, the point I made earlier about us being a self-sustaining auxiliary is that anything we decide to do, our residents have to pay for. Um, there is no other money. And so we have to make decisions about everything, but also about sustainability based on that model. And we think, and, and, and truly it's part of sustainability, financial sustainability is wrapped up in the definition of sustainability. It's oftentimes ignored uh, and, and sort of uh, more green uh, specific or, or easier to identify sort of low hanging fruit topics are focused on. But for example, if you're talking about, um, and I saw this in one of the student questions that was sent out, if you're talking about locally grown organic foods that, that people who, don't have, who are not affluent can't afford, you're not talking about a sustainable model from a financial point of view because it's not accessible to everyone. So one of the things we talk about is leveraging our buying power to promote change. You can think of the Coca-Cola example. Casey will share some other examples with you um, in a little bit. But we, we take that part serious uh, because ultimately the other thing we do annually is we actually present our budget proposal to our students um, to get a sense of them buying into these increases that we're going to inevitably, uh, it's, it's ironic, nothing ever goes down. The cost of nothing, things don't tend to go down. They go up a little bit every year. And we have those conversations with our students proactively uh, to let them know what that's going to look like and where that money's going and what we're trying to do about it. Uh, and these are some, some ways that we talk about doing that, reducing operating costs as a matter of principle, um, uh, being st cautious stewards of the students' dollars, and then expecting vendors, particularly those that have big contracts with us, to report um, some of their sustainability practices to us as we make decisions as well. Uh, and then a big one, and I mentioned this, and Casey will talk about it in depth, is uh, providing quality dining experiences that support healthy food systems. Again, um, talking about things like real food, vendor practices, and, and waste diversion. And I will let her take over from here. So I'm going to talk to you about dining from more of a food systems perspective, and then we'll look at sustainability and operationalizing that. So we'll go over what we do, how we do it, um, what guides our decisions, uh, how we balance business and values, and what some of the challenges are in that. So you may have seen this before. It's our mission uh, in UW Dining to host experiences with our community that matter for life. And that's not just food. Um, we need to set up a social architecture in our system as well. This is where you live, and there's more to going to dinner than just eating. So we try to build that in as well. Uh, we also focus on teaching and demonstration. So if you've been to Local Point, we have a chef's kitchen. We offer um, a variety of classes through that kitchen. Some nutrition classes are also done there. Um, and we do demos. So last year, Chef Tracy went to the food bank. She picked a selection of items. She brought it back to the chef's kitchen, and she did a demo for some more elevated foods you can make out of those dry goods. Canned goods aren't always so exciting, but if you can't afford that fresh food, you shouldn't feel like you have less options. So we try to put that out there. 
Um, and we have a few different ways that you can have this experience, whether it's res dining or markets, our cafes, we have food trucks, our DM to go line, and then there's Conibear. Not everybody's familiar with Conibear. It's an athletic specific dining facility. So you can't just go there and eat, um, but they have a bit of a unique situation because they have nutritional guidelines that they have to abide by. So with all of this, because of this financial stewardship and us being responsible, we have to build in mechanisms for feedback into this infrastructure. And part of the ways we have done that is with our CSA, um, Student Advisory Board, and our Secret Shoppers. So we have built in a Secret Shopper program so that people can spot check us. Um, they report back, they give us feedback. We require that all of our managers read that feedback list out what actions they're gonna take based on that feedback, and reply so that people feel heard. Um, the RCSA and the Student Advisory Board, when Clive mentioned about taking those rates and presenting them to students to get feedback, that's what we do with these bodies. We also meet monthly, um, and the RCSA in particular goes into the dorms, elicits uh, feedback from people, and then brings it to us, and we are required to respond um, and not just with words, but with our actions. So we do our best to build in these mechanisms so that you feel heard um, and so that we take action based on what you're telling us. So what does that look like in numbers? Some of you may have seen this slide before um, in the previous food systems class I was at, but we are looking at over 40,000 transactions a day and the lion's share of those happen at the DM but that is a lot of transactions to handle. Um, and it equates to about $50 million. So, down to business. So what are some of the key parts of our program? Uh, as Clive said, we are self-sustaining and our food revenue contributes to our operating budget. Um, Revenue helps us, the more revenue we get, the better products we can provide. None of us get, you know, big raises. The state mandates our raise to be fiscally responsible so that we can manage the extra money properly. Um, we still have regular business expenses. We have to pay rent, we have to pay our employees, we gotta keep the lights on. Um, and we have to cover the benefits for our employees. Living in Seattle is expensive. We have union workers on campus. They have a generous benefits package as they should, but that costs money also, and we have to take that into consideration. So for every dollar you spend, what does that look like? Well, 37% or so goes towards just the cost of food. 38% goes towards paying people to make that food and then 11% goes towards paying utilities and things of that nature. So right there, you are over 80% of your dollar just going to the operations. On top of that, we have reserve and capital spending that we use to repair things and build new um, facilities, and then we have our admin budget, which we use to pay the people that pay the people, um, basically. So when we asked you questions earlier about how much you spend on dinner for two, it was sort of split between five to 10 and 10 to 15. And that is your cost of food, essentially. A grocery store has a much higher cost of food, so they don't have as much revenue. So we'll assume your $10 now is $9. So take that and essentially double it, because you have to pay yourself to cook food. On top of that, you have to pay for the gas to keep your oven running so you can cook that food. Where are you now with that money? It's a lot higher. And so that is the piece that we have to manage and we have to take into consideration. It's not as easy as I spent $5 on bread, so call it a day. I'm good. I'm only taking $5 out of my wallet. It's complex, and all food systems are complex. So how do we take all of that information, all of these values, and insert them into supporting a healthy food system? Because you can have a food system that isn't healthy or isn't sustainable, but that doesn't do anybody any good, at least not that we think. So we lean heavily on our food system philosophy, and Clive talked about this earlier. It was in our mission. Um, we 
go out of our way to try and have a sustainable approach. So all of our purchasing, all of our procurement, a large part of my job is to try and gear that towards local spend. Uh, we do our best to incorporate verified organic purchases whenever we can um, and sustainably raised food as well as the prevention of food and packaging waste. So because we operate with state money, we have rules about what we can do with that money. So when we put out a big contract for something, it's called an RFP, a request for proposal. We have to put forth unbiased requirements, post that, and let people respond. When we do that, we always include things about sustainability. So we recently did one for bakeries. Alki happened to win the award. But in that, we asked them to tell us how can they contribute to education. Do you have an internship you can offer? Can you come and speak to a class about a business? Something like that. Sustainability-wise, how do you package your food? Are you gonna deliver it to me individually packaged so that we're using five times the waste? Can it be composted or recycled? So in Alki's case, part of their award was due to the fact that they deliver their food in predominantly compostable packaging and what isn't compostable is recyclable and has a barrier between the food and the packaging. So for the most part, it remains non-food soiled. Um, and that is something that we just build into our process because it's a big part of our values. Uh, we also look for innovative change. We partner with lots of student groups and outside organizations and we try to focus on whole foods, not over-processed. Um, things like that. So we do that through collaboration, both on and off campus, and we have sort of a variety of categories that we collaborate on. Um, sustainability, we work with obviously the sustainability committee that Clive and I are on, um, but there are a few sustainability committees throughout campus. We also work with UW Recycling, who sends me a report on our waste stream monthly. So, for example, yesterday I got a message from UW Recycling that there was a container in the waste stream that wasn't compostable. They wanted to know what happened because it had a CPK label on it. And our grab-and-go items, with the exception of the heat and serve, are all supposed to be packaged and compostable. So she sent me a picture of what that item was. I sent it to the chef. They figured out what happened, disposed, or donated, I should say, um, to an outside um, organization, all of the non-compostable packaging. So there was no more confusion. Um, but that's the, that's the level of granularity that we get to. Uh, we work with UW Farms. Uh, we have an obligated spend with them. So we have an MOU that says we're gonna spend this much money with you. And they rely on that. It helps them plan, it helps them pay their people. Um, and it's a stable source of income. There's not a lot of stability in food service or food procurement, so you have to take it where you can get it, and we try to build it in so we can support each other. Uh, we also have the UW Food Bank. When outside food trucks come onto campus, we typically request that they donate 10% of their sales to the food bank. Um, we also work with food insecurity committees, other student groups like SEED and Huskies for Justice. And then off campus, we participate in a program with Food Lifeline. We take all of our leftover food, we package it in two pound bags because getting big bulk food via donation doesn't always feel great. So we package it in two pound bags, we freeze it so that people can receive these donations, thaw it out, and have a nice meal. We also do a lot of work with our peers. So we participate in a variety of different sustainability organizations um, and college and university groups, and we report out. And that gives us the ability to kind of get a benchmark for how we're doing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that reporting looks like. Uh, it also includes the group AISHI, which Clive mentioned earlier. Um, and they can give us ratings on not just our food procurement, but our general sustainable practices. And then we have major company partners. So we use US Foods and Charlie's Produce. We use Wilcox Farms. All of the eggs on, Wilco on our campus are from Wilcox. And we uh, work with Starbucks and Coca-Cola, which I will talk to you about in a second. Wilcox Farm recently had a meeting with them. They were having a bald eagle problem. You can't... <laughs> You can't do anything to the bald eagles because they're protected, so they tried a variety of sustainable options. 
they bought those giant inflatable wacky things and put them all over the farm. The eagles tore them up. That was not successful. They ended up getting a grip of uh, Great Pyrenees puppies. And they put those puppies with the chickens, which was uneventful, surprisingly. Um, they bonded, the dogs bonded with the chickens, and the dogs lived with the chickens. And when the bald eagles swoop down to try and snatch up a chicken, the dog runs after them. I will say, rest assured, the dogs are not quick enough to catch them. Um, but I had a Great Pyrenees grown up. They're 160-pound dogs, so they are a good deterrent. So when we talk about collaboration outside and the menus of change in particular, that's something we're heavily involved in. Um, and there are these principles of healthy and sustainable menus. On your right side are the concepts, and on your left side are the actionable items. So we've made a commitment to incorporate these into our menus, uh, regardless of what we're doing. So that allows us to provide a little more option for making a conscious, healthy choice. So when we built Taro, we did it deliberately without meat coming on the bowls. You can still get that, but it is a conscious choice that we want you to make. And we're trying to move more in that direction. What we don't want to do is take away options. We don't want to be exclusionary. Not everybody can afford the same kind of food, but we do want you to make the choice. And we want it to be a conscious choice rather than a default. We also participate in the protein flip, which is tracking to show us metric-wise how we're doing moving toward a plant-forward meal. So we brought Beyond Burgers onto this campus a few years ago, um, and those have done very well. You may not, you know, as a meat eater, you may not be comfortable switching to tofu, but maybe you can go with a meat analog. <coughs> Lots of vegans may not like the meat analog, so we still have veggie burgers. So supporting our healthy food system, um, some of the things that we do on campus currently are the purchase-only cage-free organic eggs, that's Wilcox. In addition to them being cage-free organic, there's a new certification, and I forget exactly what it's called, uh, humane something. Those chickens have 118 square feet per chicken available to wander around. That was bigger than my dorm room when I was in college. Um, so all, puppy, yeah, and they have a puppy, which <laughs> is just, I really missed out. Um, so we partner with the UW Farm, which we spoke about. We purchase products from Shepherd's Grain, which is a really great local clean label company. Um, we source sustainable, locally processed, and wild seafood whenever possible. We buy a lot of stuff through Ocean Seafood, which is mostly processed locally. We um, do our best to gear ourselves towards Alaskan seafood as well. All of our utensils, plates, cups, bowls, and straws are compostable, as Clive said. Um, the thoughtful packaging we try to focus on. 52% of our purchases are made within 250 miles. Now, there's a little bit of a caveat to that, but we'll get to that in just one second. So, you can see these numbers, right? I'm not going to mislead you. We focus and we strive to get organic and local, but it's hard. And where the numbers changed significantly was a few years ago, Coke and Starbucks was no longer considered local. It used to be. Um, Starbucks is, their headquarters is in Soto. Um, lots of their manufacturing is in Soto. But it's a big corporation, and not all of their ingredients are local. Coca-Cola was bottled in Bellevue. And for a long time, that was considered enough to be local. But that changed as well. And you can see when those things changed, the numbers started going down pretty significantly. And our overall spend went up on food. So we are working on building that back up, and it is a process. But we will continue to work on it. So voting with your dollars. All of you earlier when you answered questions, some of the main answers for what you buy um, were eggs, protein, rice, and bread. So 
we get a lot of feedback about wanting to carry more organic items, and we want to incorporate more organic items. But chicken fingers continue to be the most purchased protein on campus. Who had chicken fingers in the last two weeks? Anybody? Okay. Whale. Just saying. I saw someone start to raise their hand, and then they looked. Don't feel shame. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look back. We all want a chicken tender every once in a while. That's fine, but you know it's a it's a balance between supply and demand and meeting students where they are, right? So we understand the values and we understand the importance of all of this, but we also have to track where the dollars are spent, and it's a process to slowly transition and to balance that supply and demand because it's kind of uneven right now. And that's just a, that's a difficult thing to work on and we will continue to work on it and there's no perfect answer to it. But what I can tell you is we want the same things. We want to offer options and we want people to be able to make healthy, conscious choices. That being said, we can't just change everything in one day. And we also can't take things away entirely because like I said, some people want that chicken tender. Some people can't afford those organic strawberries. So when it comes to operationalizing sustainability outside of food, um, as we said, 100% of these uh, serviceware items, forks, spoons, knives, all that jazz are compostable. Um, and like Clive said, we have worked with these bigger companies. So in an organization of this size, we don't have the luxury of only working with local small businesses. We have to work with some of these larger corporations. That being said, we have made the commitment that if we're gonna do that, we don't wanna sacrifice our values. So we have pushed Coca-Cola to do this soft-sided compostable cup. Starbucks, we told them, you just can't bring those straws onto campus. So we took the initiative. We partnered with a vendor outside of the university. Uh, we had to provide them the color code for the green straw. We had to get this approved by Starbucks. It took quite some time. But now these two items are used worldwide. Had we not worked with Coca-Cola and Starbucks, this wouldn't have happened for anybody. Uh, we have a reusable cup program that saved us five tons of waste the first year that we ran it because compost, excuse me, compostable cups weren't going into the waste stream. And we work with Seed to pilot a reusable container program right now. So it's happening at local point. You get a little coin. You go to the counter when you order your food and you hand that coin over. They take your food and they package it in this reusable container instead. You take it, you eat it, do with, with it what you will. Um, we don't need you to fully wash it, just spray out all the chunky stuff and pop it back in this machine and you get another coin and you do it all over again. Um, and that was supported by the Campus Sustainability Fund, which Clive is gonna come back up and talk to you about. Yeah, really quickly, uh, so we have time for the Q&A. The Campus Sustainability Fund um, grants about almost half a million dollars each year to student-based projects. Um, for example, some of the ones that we've partnered with in the past is we have a, a solar array on Mercer Court, and that was a project maybe four or five years ago with some graduate students who wanted to actually study um, um, energy uh, infrastructure security. Uh, and so we created a, an, an energy infrastructure, and certainly there was benefit to that. Um, there's, there's other projects listed, uh, landscape rest restoration, a sustainable learning space by the Fishery Sciences Building, um, et cetera. Um, and then a little bit more about UW sustainability, trying to tie it all back in. Um, and this is in your slide, so you can check it out. I'm gonna make sure we leave uh, time at the end. Uh, as you can see, we're, we're rated gold by AC Stars since 2012, uh, oftentimes touted by the Princeton Review, the Green Honor Roll, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, currently, the main focus of UW Sustainability is the sustainability plan. It's very dense. I would recommend you go to their website um, and read it for yourself. Uh, and it's very comprehensive. Yeah, we have gone back and forth on the same sentence, I think, a dozen times. So, so it took questions. A while. I just kind of flipped through the last few. My, I trust that you all will go and read it for yourself and learn as much as you possibly can. So, we wanted to allow time for questions. If you have any. Questions? Yeah. I have a question to start us off. 
Um, you mentioned that in the athletic center dining option, there's nutritional guidelines. There Can are. you tell us a little bit more about that? Or is there a yeah, so there's guidelines that the NCAA puts forth, and then athletics also has their own uh, dietetics team. But when you go into Conabair, there are no salt shakers on the table. There is no coffee available. There is no ice cream. They get acai bowls, Powerade, water, and milk. Um, there are limits on salt. There are limits on the fresh food that, you're, that they're using. Um, so they don't get the same amount of convenience items that we can use in some of the res halls. From an athletics point of view, obviously. Right. Other questions? Easy yes. Enough. All right. So, like, as to the Thank you. Uh, the biggest challenge we have is, um, as Casey and I both shared, our most of what we offer is compostable, and if it's not, it's usually recyclable. But UW waste, um, UW recycling, rather, uh, we find that um, seventy-five percent of the garbage that's uh, going to a landfill is comprised of compostable and recyclable items, and that is students putting them in there. And so I think really stopping, taking a moment, there's three cans, figure out which one your thing belongs in, and, and help us. And I think uh, for a long time I used to go to these uh, sustainability conferences in higher education, and we were so far ahead of other institutions back then, and I would say we have, we have these sustainability Ferraris, and our students don't want to drive them. Like, just getting you all to interact correctly with the things that we have, whether it's the sorting, your waste. We have shower heads that are not going to take paint off, and some of you want that. But that is, they're aerated to save water. We have, we have um, uh, uh, thermostats that go back down. They reset when there's not activity or not adjustments to them. That's to save energy. All of that is part of the lead infrastructure that we're putting in place we really just need students to participate with it the way it's designed. We have videos that walk you through what that process looks like. But I think really just taking a moment and thinking about how your individual action can, have, can make a difference. Because we've tried to build you the infrastructure. We just need you all to interact with it the, right, the best way. And I would say the same thing goes for food. So if you want organic, spend your money on organic, and we will see that the velocity of those items is increasing, and we will adjust. But it's very difficult for us to adjust if the messaging that we're getting doesn't match the dollars that you're voting with. So the more you can fortify that and continue giving us feedback, pleasant or otherwise, sometimes it's not pleasant, but by all means. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was looking at me. I thought everyone was looking at you. I could just do this on the so, side. So by all means, keep engaging with the system. The last thing we want is for people to get frustrated and stop engaging. Yes? Are there any type of any sort of training program for employees working with the Panda Foods? For example, like the people packaging the stuff? What sort of, you mean sustainability-wise? Right. So that is a very good point, and thank you for bringing it up. There is a huge training and education element to this, and it's not just specific to the consumer. It is something that we have to work on. And we have been getting better at that. Um, it's getting easier because the compostability is a little more widespread. So at this point, I think more people understand the situation. As the purchasing specialist, my responsibility is when we choose an item, making sure that people are educated on that choice so that they understand why we did it, why it's important, and what action they need to take to accommodate the new practice. Good question. Other? No? All right. Well, thank you all for paying attention to us. And yeah, thank please you. check out the, the slideshow at the end. And uh, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much.